So Cheryl, um, at the start, before your uh, before being the director of Pemimpin GSL Malaysia, you were a teacher at an international school. Before serving at a public binang tunggal at Kedah, where you saw firsthand the white inequality gap. And then after that, you continued to champ champion education through initiatives such as Pemimpin GSL. So I was wondering if you could just tell us about the inequalities you observe between, you know, the international school you served in for, at first and the school in Kedah, and what disparities were actually worsened by the COVID pandemic. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me, everyone. Uh, so um, I think definitely uh, as I left the international school to teach in Pinang Tunggal, uh, definitely. Definitely, it's quite apparent the kind of inequities that will be there. Uh, of course, the students in the international school um, had an excellent chance at fulfilling their potential. But I think for me, what I saw that was very apparent is uh, in the international school, no matter how much, no matter how much you were struggling with your uh, with school, right? It was impossible to fail. It was impossible for any child to fail because of the way the system was, and of course, uh, the facilities that were in school and the kind of support that they provided every child to succeed. Uh, but I think when I went to Pinang Tunggal, uh, perhaps one of the biggest things that was missing was that right, uh, the students who are. Um, who are succeeding than the students who were uh, left behind. But I think um, at the core of a lot of things that I saw was almost the same. Uh, in the international school, I worked with students who, uh, who needed extra help, so in the learning support department. And what I saw was uh, these students really lacked the attention of their parents. And because of that, they could not do well in their studies because they I had a lot of issues at home. And it was the same in Pinang Tunggal, right? So regardless of the, where they came from, uh, it showed me that the how important it was for parents' uh, involvement in education. I think that was one of the most apparent things that I saw. Um, and in talking about the pandemic and how it would have uh, and how it has affected especially students from lower income, I think it's it's very clear that uh, there is a huge gap uh, between students who can afford the data and devices to continue on with their online learning and students who cannot. But I also must say at this point, uh, it's been a year and a lot of Malaysian teachers have um, have tried many different ways to reach out to even their students who have no access. So I know a few schools in Kedah who have been providing like hard, uh, hard copy of modules for their students to reach out to it. Uh, so I think while there exist a lot of challenges and a lot of gaps, but also a lot of opportunities and a lot of uh, inspiration that we can find uh, despite all this. Okay, thank you, Cheryl, for that. Um, it's really insightful, um, especially from a personal experience of an, a person who actually transitioned um, to two different I guess, environments of teaching. Speaking about experience, um, this question is sort of directed to Cikgu Yasmin. So from your own personal experience as a STEM teacher, how has teaching evolved in this era? Because, you know, our time when we was physical, slightly different, we can go to laboratories, right? So how has things changed for you and how have you tried to overcome these limitations? But more importantly, has technology developed to help you overcome these limitations? I think you're muted, Chegu. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you, uh, Hilmi, and uh, Assalamualaikum, and hi everyone. Okay, I'm Cikgu Yasmin. Okay, so um, I would like to like uh, you know, visit um the first time I started teaching that was like about 19 years ago in 2002, and I would say that I started actually using laptop back then, and it was definitely not a norm. Nobody uses it. Okay, and then I became like you know a data teacher, and my laptop came in super handy, but at that time, it was like having a computer is a luxury and not even a smartphone. But looking forward, like I welcome the changes because um, I, I would say that, you know, I'm adaptable and I love the fact, the fact that, you know, most of the teachers now, like what Cheryl mentioned just now, like, you know, it has been a year and it's not even about that. I mean, this year alone, even before, okay, we already started. And I love the fact that now we can do actually more things to the students due to the technology. So it's not something new to me, but it's like a great upgrade. 
So um, when you say in this era, are you like referring to the pandemic era or like, you know, to the 21st century pandemic yeah, era? Yeah, pandemic. okay. Yeah. So, yeah, because being in a pandemic sort of forced the teachers to adapt. So that's the keyword. Yeah. So being adaptable to the situation, adapting to the burst of the technology, apps that are being thrown at you, you know, like suddenly, you know, there's burst of app and every week you see teachers having online webinars, like each of them taking turns and initiatives of their own yeah, to learn new things. And the best part is they even conduct them themselves online and these we all we work non-stop okay we don't have like you know a free time and people actually say everywhere that you know we have our free time we don't actually now and i saw that even though we don't really see you know our free time but i, I saw that most of the teachers are actually highly spirited we don't even wait for gpn or ppd to conduct seminars for us anymore so we do it ourselves so it's like now we are learning what we wanted our way we choose our ground we choose which speaker we want to follow and learn from we even pay for it you know it's no more you know like you're being bombarded like, okay this saturday you have to go to this course that saturday you go to that course like, no more and this is definitely refreshing i can see people adapting to it slowly yes slowly but surely yeah it may be not all but a majority of us are doing it so yeah thank you Jake, yasmin um it was actually amazing when you enlightened us to say that um with this new shift in online technology and online education, you actually can do more things than you could have done if it was physical. And it's sort of like, I agree with that. So specifically as a student, um, I realized that with technology, you are able to say, for example, revise certain things by literally listening to an entire video while I'm lying down on my bed. So I kind of agree very much with that. Um, so speaking of the transition um, as a um, university student, this is sort of to Dr. Sharo. Um, you're a university lecturer, um, specifically teaching law. Um, so in your paper, Turning Charcoal into Diamonds, Time Pressure Assessment as a Tool for Transformative Education, um, you seek to look at potential outcomes of using time-based assessments to replicate the environment of the legal industry. So on that note, on market readiness, what do you think or to what extent does online education actually affect students' market readiness or industry readiness? Or does it actually help them because now everything is online and companies are moving towards digitalization? They are actually assisted by that. Okay. Thank you, Hilmi. I think you're also a law student, right? Final year law student? Yes, I am. Yeah, if I was in UAE, I would be teaching you civil procedure, I think. If you enter my section, that would be... <laughs> okay. Right. Thank you very much for the question. Yeah. Um, I think you can look at it from two angles. Yeah. But it boils down to one very important question. Yeah. It depends on the discipline, actually. If we're talking about a discipline as traditional as our discipline, I would say our because I'm uh, I'm referring this to Helmi as well. Right. So if you're talking about the industry as traditional and as conventional as ours, I would say that um, it could assist the student in one way, but it could also hamper them from actually actually uh, become industry ready for the industry because um, uh, the industry itself is not moving as fast as uh, the teaching and learning I would say for example yeah I would um, I'm not sure whether everyone is aware of this the Malaysian courts are actually adopting artificial intelligence to help the judges in criminal courts yeah to decide on the appropriate sentences so the algorithm will actually compute all the decisions by the previous judges in the previous cases and that will help them to make a more sound judgment so the industry does move so i do agree with you to a certain extent that it does actually move to digitization but the industry itself is not going as fast as we are hoping it to be for example in the teaching and learning of law i'm doing hearings with my students via zoom but um hearings are fine and i'm also and in, in uk and we have trials done in in zooms as well I'm sure in other law schools, these things are done as well. But uh, in the industry itself, there's so many things to consider. Yeah, When you talk about hearing, it's fine. But when you talk about, uh, for example, doing trials, there are a lot of issues that you have to consider, whether there will be uh, tampering with the evidence, Yeah, whether there will be misleading statements by the witness, so on and so forth. So if you're talking about, coming back to your question, if you're talking about an industry that is uh, traditional like law, for example, 
the fact that uh, we are now resorting to online learning could, of course, help them in a way. They might, if, if before this, they are not prepared, yeah, they are not very uh, familiar with uh, Google Document, for example, or Google Sheets, for example. Yeah? They might be using Microsoft Word yeah, and printing things out and sending it to their lecturers. But now with the advent of technology and because of COVID-19, everything is online, so they have to change, they have to shift. Yeah? But at an, in a, from another angle, if you look at it, it could also hamper uh, them from actually uh, being industry ready. Yeah, because um, to be industry ready for a field like law, for example, the industry is still there, it's still face-to-face. -face. Most of the things are still face-to-face. -face, yeah? So um, when they go into teaching and learning, which is very much online-based, and when they go into the industry, which is not so online-based, then it will become a bit of a problem for them. Yeah. So uh, I think um, that is uh, two ways of looking at this. But if you're talking about industry that is very um, apini, uh, very fluid, a very apini, uh, something like, for example, mass communication, for example, then that should not be a problem. I, I, I'm assuming here, because this is not actually my field, but I'm assuming that in those areas, I think it's more convenient. It's, it is more flexible. But this morning, I just had one workshop. Yeah, training some uh, lecturers how to use virtual reality they come from diverse backgrounds some of them were most of them were actually from media and technology background yeah this they have no problem in implementing virtual reality in their class. But I remember one like so some disciplines I think it would very much help the students to be industry ready. Some disciplines at this juncture, not yet. Yeah, it, the, the industry is moving towards digitization, for example, like law. But it's not there yet as how we hope it is. All right, thank you so much for the answer. I'll take note as a law student. <laughs> Yeah, no, thank you so much, Dr. Dr. Digitizing is like really good or it's like really bad. But yeah, I think it is important to remember that it's not at that simple, like it's very nuanced. And, you know, like different industries or different communities have different needs. You know, how some communities might be able to exploit thoroughly like all the internet resources, whereas in some other communities where even getting um, portable water and like food is like difficult. So yeah, like thank you for like giving us this like nuanced view into like different industries and communities as well. Um, so on that topic of like you know accessibility and stuff like that, um, since budget twenty nineteen actually, and up to this year's budget twenty twenty one, the Ministry of Education has actually received the highest budget allocation out of all the different ministries since twenty nineteen. So. The thing that a lot of people are wondering are, is are we actually investing enough money in education as a nation? And if so, uh, what are we doing wrong? What are we still getting wrong? Because we are investing a lot of money in education, but still there are many holes and you know stuff like that in our system. So I was wondering, uh, Cheryl, if you could like share some thoughts on this. Thank you so much. So I think definitely, uh... Ministry of Education gets the highest budget every year, but uh, we know that a lot of it goes into um, salaries uh, because we also know that the Ministry of Education has one of the highest uh, headcounts, uh, uh, nearly 400,000 teachers under them. Uh, so we know a lot of this goes into salaries, uh, maintaining the staff. We have the PPDs, we have the district officers, the JPNs as well. We also know that a large amount of the budget goes into infrastructure. So continuously uh, ensuring that the Schola Schola Da If, right, the schools that are very um, uh, the schools that are very underserved uh, have enough infrastructure. So I think uh, a lot of the budget, while it's focused, of course, salaries are essential and infrastructure as well. I feel like the part that it's most lacking is to focus on the training and development of teachers. So we know that the quality of education is only as good as the quality of our teachers. And um, in a lot of our research, we found that uh, sometimes teachers were not given the uh, opportunity to attend a lot of trainings, especially within the ministry itself. And Chegu Yasmin can speak more uh, about this. So 
I think what we would want to see instead is the budget being focused a bit more on providing teachers with very strong, very strategic training and development. Like Chegu, uh, Yasmin mentioned just now, sometimes uh, some teachers even pay for their own personal development. But imagine if that budget was gone into now really offering them world-class, like excellent training and development every year to guide them. So we, because we we want while we want our teachers to teach following the latest 21st century uh, teaching skills and all of that but if we don't provide them with the enough training to do so uh, then it will be the same they will teach the way they are taught or they will teach the way they were teaching in their ipgs so i think um there must be a significant budget put into uh, training and development and then perhaps we will see a shift uh, in in the teaching and learning uh, no, thank you so much, Cheryl, for that answer, uh, which is like why um, you do uh, the stuff you do with Pimpin Pim Jazz Malaysia. So like I know that you train uh, school leaders such as principals and, you know, people in the school to like how to manage the schools more effectively, how to make sure um, students can achieve their full potential. And I also saw a webinar hosted by on, on your website, which taught actually taught teachers um, how to do like effective techniques on uh, online education and how to like engage students which I thought was really nice and yeah I thought it would be really helpful if like every teacher could have watched that webinar and yeah but I agree I think um, in Malay it's a pembangunan model in sun it's like uh, yeah like just teaching them more and always uh, in ensuring that they improve every year yeah giving them a goal uh, on a bit of attention, but uh, to Dr. Sharu, um, is there a need to reevaluate the metrics of education, specifically exam marks and grades, given the new norm of open book examinations, or should there even be any new metrics? Because as we know now, in the time of COVID, where many institutions have shifted to open book exams, so people are wondering about, you know, what, what should the metrics of education be? Should it be, you know, memorization or, you know, stuff like that? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I think I would start by saying that um, I've always been a strong believer in terms of letting the students refer to whatever that they want to refer during exams. Not a very, um, uh, I'm not a very, uh, I don't really believe in examination as a mode of assessment. But then again, that would very much me because of my method of teaching is very much based on something called cons constructivism. So it's based on discoveries, there's no lectures and all that. So um, just to answer your question, I think um, before the COVID-19, I remember going around Malaysia to train lecturers on how to use online learning, how to teach according to their learning outcome, the constructive alignments, you know, you have to make sure that your assessment regime and your TL activities has to be in line so that you will achieve your learning outcomes, so on and so forth. And I remember that every time I go for this workshop with a group of lecturers under commentary, yeah? so what happens is that every time we go, we get bombarded with questions and some of the lecturers and teachers are quite angry. So you're teaching us how to teach. We know how to handle our classes, you know. So it's like at that time, the atmosphere was more of uh, it's a choice. You can attend the workshop. You can choose to listen to us. You can try to you know, take this as something that will enrich your methods or uh, it's up to you or you can stay as you are. So even if when, when some universities or institutions try to impose yeah, on their lecturers, you know, you have to change your methods. You have to reconsider uh, new metrics, new rubrics, new method of assessment. Yeah, Some lecturers went and say that, you know, it, it's fine. When I don't do this, when I don't do what you are saying, it does not mean that I'm a bad lecturer. You know, it, it doesn't mean that I cannot teach. Uh, the, 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 the perception at that particular time, I think before COVID-19, is that once you become a lecturer, you are assumed to know how to teach. You assume to know about Bloom's taxonomy, the constructive alignment and all those things. Yeah? But once the COVID-19 comes, yeah, okay, it actually pushes everyone to go and, uh, you know, uh, lecturers to teach from home and students to learn from home. And we have no choice. And the sole choice that we have is to actually reconsider everything. I, I remember last year when we had, uh, when, when COVID-19 started, yeah, I was actually two days before PKP, the, the full lockdown, the 
proper lockdown. Yeah, was announced. I was in Malacca giving a a workshop. I remember that everybody, all educators, teachers in all the WhatsApp groups that I know, they became very panicked and they keep on asking what should we do. So I remember making a video about how to use Zoom, a very simple video, and it gained like I think about thousands of viewers. So last year was about you know grabbing anything that I can. I'm thinking now, so I'm just going to get anything, but. Now, I think as we move to this year, it's it's now about reconsidering, you know, whether exam is still the way to go, yeah? Whether um, if we want to go with exam, uh, do we allow open book, yeah? These things are to be reconsidered. And I think lecturers, educators, teachers, yeah, they are, they are somehow compelled. You know, if before this, they are not really willing, they're reluctant to consider this, to look back into this. Now they have to, because... There are so many ways of how you can actually assess your students. Exam is just one of the ways, and it is, of course, one of the easiest way. But exam is only if you are using cognitivism as your method of uh, delivery. So uh, I think to answer your question, uh, now everybody is actually reconsidered. And my personal view on this is that, yes, a new matrix is uh, needed, a new way of assessment is needed, and uh, that is necessary at this moment. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Sharo. Um, I actually resonate a lot with um, that sentiment. So say, for example, exams, I don't learn as much as um, preparing for an exam compared to actually drafting a letter or a document kind of thing. And that's why I actually get a bit giddy when lecturers tell me to, you know, an assignment is about drafting a contract that's actually a bit more interesting. Um, so I resonate a lot with that. Um, besides the pressure and stress of preparing for an, for an exam is slightly more overwhelming. Um, but let's just shift away from the formal education and more into things like extracurricular, um, because we've heard a lot um, from the past speakers about the need for us to reevaluate education or how education, the formal education should go about. But I want to draw this attention to Cikgu Yasmin when it comes to extracurricular activities, because I think this plays a huge role in developing a more holistic um, student um, some of us has been luck, have been lucky enough to participate a lot in extracurricular activities, debating, public speaking, organized by IWAN, and so on and so forth. And how does COVID affect this? Um, as you say, Chek Yasmin, you can do a lot more than what we could have before. So in your opinion, what are the limits or what can we achieve more in this era when it comes to extracurricular activities for students? Okay, um, in terms of uh, extracurricular activities, uh... Yeah, because um, I used to take my students hiking, okay, and uh, we have um, weekly STEM, uh, STEM club meetings and uh, also scouts meetings. So, you know, these are the go-to, the one that keeps me alive throughout the week, actually. Okay, not only my classes, but also my, my clubs and also my scouts. And um, losing that part, because, you know, I think it's more on the student. It's really, really more on the student because they lose their identity. I could see that, you know, they're just, they're just someone or maybe like some entity that people expect them to enter classes after classes after classes. And nobody cares, you know, about like, yeah, people do ask. You know, I, I've seen like a, a few, you know, collaborations. I've seen like, you know, people actually ask like, okay, how are you? Are you okay today? And, you know, and then we start class. But they're, they're just expected to be there in class and, you know, so when they, they they don't have the extracurricular activities anymore, like how would they you know be themselves again? How would they? How would we see them you know being leaders? They they cannot. And you know, when they enter class, last time we used to have um, yeah. It's it's funny that I I speak of this like it's like so back in the past. Like you know we used to have um class monitors. We have uh prefects, right? Who are they now? And nobody. Okay, nobody like assign them to do anything. Nobody says uh, anything about them, like, you know, taking attendance or whatever, nothing. Just, they just lost it, lost that identity of them. So the extracurricular acti activities are actually building them up. But we still have our scouts meeting. I still have them over Discord. And um, yeah, my uh, court of honor actually, you know, made a great job. Uh, my, my uh, how do I say, troop leader, okay, Ariel Hazim and his, uh, you know, his uh, court of honor is actually, 
you know wonderful to me because they actually conducted meetings after meetings but they made it in a in a way that okay get the students to draw like you know badges you know and like uh made up powerpoints learning more on learning more on learning like you know the the theoretical part of it but at least they're doing something at least the role is that so it's back to them and what is my role in that i was just watching i was just like you know just 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 be on the you know just pulling a little bit of string there and like you know make sure that the meeting is there but i gave 100% uh how to say um, like responsibility to them and i could see that they actually embrace it well so i felt that you know i need to give it to them but in a different way so get them to organize get them to to still have the meetings make them you know and i didn't even tell them okay do you do this do that okay this week you do this i i don't do that anymore so it's it's a bit refreshing to see that you know they actually can adapt to it when when you gave them like a task they they just take up the challenge and you know that's how wonderful children are they can adapt yeah um thank you jay griesmin um for that speaking about prefects like i it suddenly gives a bit of flashbacks you know like the prefects wearing the different shirts and the blazers and then you walk tall rasa handsome jalan you feel video, special video right later. Video yeah, yeah, and and then sometimes some people have like their special name tags that writes that oh. is written prefect. It's made <laughs> of gold. So I, I I guess it's a shame that a lot of students lose um, this opportunity, even if it sounds petty. It's a it's a part of growing up, and I think it's sad that a lot of kids are missing the chance to grow up the way we did. You know. A hundred percent, like. For me, like extracurriculars was also something I look forward to, if not more than like academics, like school time. So I definitely agree, and I'm I'm glad that you know to see that teachers are adapting to the challenge of you know still trying to bring, as uh, to the best of their ability, co-curriculars to, uh, the students. And yeah, that's great. And speaking on, uh, speaking of co-curriculars, uh, as a And as a former avid choral speaker myself, um, yeah, I do agree that you know, uh, extracurriculars are very important and stuff. So, um, Cheryl, um, where you had a stint while you were in Kedah, you um, got them into choral speaking. So yeah, I felt a connection with that. But now, uh, being the director of Pemimpin GSL, which aims to train uh, school leaders, and also previously being involved in Teach for Malaysia. It seems like a systemic problem that the current Malaysian education system is so reliant on NGOs on issues that have plagued the system since forever. So I was just wondering uh, how effective you thought you think the response of the MOE was in handling the shift to online learning, and on the same page, what do you think is the future of education-related NGOs in Malaysia? All right. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so um, yeah, I I cringe a little when <laughs> you mentioned choral speaking. It's been a while. the movie <laughs> anyways uh so um i think for me um being in an uh, so the first was how what was the ministry's response towards uh, the pandemic initially so we know definitely that uh, no one was prepared for it honestly even uh when i was running my programs i thought like we'll be back to normal in a few weeks time it's like the haze right so we thought okay lah this is going to go off okay sekolah tutup Well, like the haze and then we'll come back online i will come back face to face but i think no one predicted that it's going to be so long and until today we will still be stuck um at home but uh i think initially while uh, the ministry had a bit of teething problems or like oh what do we do like how do we help our teachers i think like i mentioned just now what was really inspiring to see was how teachers uh were so resourceful by themselves like figuring out all these different ways to just uh get in touch with their students um some of our, the teachers that we worked with even taught their students full lessons on whatsapp taught their students full lessons on telegram just trying out different ways and and then i think once the ministry uh, saw that it was more long term i think now their announcements are more like okay it's going to be like today they announce okay so we are, we're not going to go back to school until 1st september and then we will still uh, wait so this gives teachers uh, a bit more stability so that they know that okay so i can mentally prepare for online teaching until september right rather than it being like a two week two week announcement um so i like that i think that is commendable on the th- on the part of you figure it out on the part of um 
of uh, NGOs and the role that we play. Uh, so I think your question just now was how, uh, what is the role that we are playing in the Malaysian education system? I think actually, to be honest, there's not many non-profits that work in the space of education. Uh, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of us, uh, there's a few like uh, Teach for Malaysia, um, sorry, I just need to spell Paw Patrol on my phone, okay. <laughs> so there's a few like Teach for Malaysia and what we do. And um, the civil society organizations for education is still not strong. Um, if you compare with other countries where actually the NGO space is booming with different efforts. So the fact that the civil society organizations is, is not strong, uh, perhaps, perhaps it's an indicator that uh, a lot of gaps are have been fixed by the ministry or there's an attempt to fix the gaps but wherever there isn't uh, this is where the non-profits come in so for me like the work that we do in Pumim Pain is really to um, offer supplementary training and teach uh, in teaching and learning especially for school leaders and uh, now we've moved into like principal preparation so teachers who aspire to become principals younger teachers uh, we are looking at how can we provide them more leadership training uh, different ways to conduct lessons different different ways to look at assessment and things like that um, I think I think there's still a, a lot a huge space in the civil society organizations for education so if anyone is thinking of starting up uh, non-profits, working on teachers or students in intervention, please continue to do so. Okay, thank you, Cheryl, for that. Um, I guess your assistant was as excited as you are. <laughs> so let's move on to the next part of this um, discussion, because the first part was trying to look at what happens in status quo. How are we coping? How are we adapting? But I think we're going to move towards the chunk of the discussion, which is about policy and what we think um, are the relevant or at least some suggestions of how we move on from COVID-19. So as we all know that accessibility is a large issue in education and it's exacerbated by COVID. It, it, it's not that it creates the problem of accessibility, it reveals the already existing problems of accessibility. In light of that, um, what were the failures in the past that led to the current issues now? And how do we think we? How do you think we should address it moving forward? Um, maybe Dr. Sharon can. We may take the floor. Yeah. Um, before I uh, give my answer, I I just would like to make a small remark about that uh, prefects being nobody. So I was never a prefect. I'm always a li librarian. So as much as I love it that they are now nobodies, but librarians are also nobodies now at the moment. Chick Yasmin. <laughs> so we don't have library to look after. <laughs> okay. The, there are three, uh, I think I can divide my answers into three parts, yeah, for Hilmi's question. Um, the first thing is maybe now is the time for us to actually reflect and uh, reconsider. I'm not sure whether everyone is aware with the concept of Maslow hierarchy of needs. Uh, Maslow hierarchy of needs is basically a concept whereby uh, it says that you uh, human beings, they will only, uh, they, will, they will move from one level of need to another one. And the one that we're talking about, education, is actually at the very top level of the Maslow hierarchy of needs. Maslow believes that if the lower level of needs are not addressed, then a uh, human being actually cannot enjoy or they will not be needing the higher level of needs. Yeah? So I think now is, uh, now is a good time for us to look back into this because before COVID-19, I think we are very much focused on the Bloom's taxonomy meaning we're very much focused on cognitive development of the student. They should remember, they should understand, they should explain, they should be able to evaluate. Yeah, all these things are very much focused on this. Even in the Bloom taxonomy itself, you have three domains actually, yeah? but we're very focused on the cognitive domain. Yeah? That's why exam is the, the trend and the practice. Uh, we, the second one that is also quite uh, focused on is the, uh, sorry, the, um, the psychomotor domain, but the effective domain in terms of the values, yeah, in terms of whether the students appreciate the value, whether they have the values in them, these are, these are actually not uh, emphasized as much as the other two domains, especially the cognitive domains. Yeah? So I think the first thing that we have to consider is when we want the students to uh, be cognitively developed, we have to consider their very basic needs first. 
if the students are tired, if the students are hungry, if the surrounding in which they are learning at home, yeah, some students have to learn in the living room yeah, with their uh, smaller siblings, younger siblings playing around, their mothers cooking and everything. Yeah? So if their surrounding is not actually taken care of, it's not addressed, then they will not be able to go up until self-actualization needs, which is education. Give them tabs, give them smartphones, give them laptops. Yeah? But if the basic things are not addressed, then it will not be able to change anything much. Yeah? So that's number one. I think my principle has always been Maslow before Blooms. So that is something that we have to consider. Number two is I'm a human rights law lecturer, actually. I teach international human rights law at the postgraduate level for master's students. So as much as we would like to say that, you know, we should give lots of budget to the Ministry of Education, you know, education should be the, the, the emphasis, you know. Another thing that we should reflect and we should think about this uh, uh, to respond to your question is the fact that um, actually everything has to come together. In, in human rights law, if you just give education, but uh, the uh, basic uh, rights are not actually addressed, then it wouldn't help either. Yeah, there's there's an issue in international human rights law where we feel that the civil and political rights, you know, are actually something that is more uh, any, uh, more suitable for the um, for the developed countries. If you look at um, if you look at the less developed countries or the developing countries, we are more uh, focus on the uh, economic, social, and cultural rights. So, I mean, like, yes, education is important. Yes, we should give lots of budget to education. We should improve education. But uh, this thing does not come independently on its own, you know. It has to be addressed together with all the other needs as well. And the last thing that I would uh, say, the, the third thing to respond to your question in, in terms of how do we move on, I think... Um, I, I've noticed that in the social media, yeah, uh, uh, we like to make comparisons. Yeah, we like to make comparisons. Oh, they are doing it very good in Sweden, in Austria, and then uh, in New Zealand, in Australia. And you name, you can name it. I think mostly. Uh, I mean, we do. We we love to make these comparisons. As an academician, when I look at these comparisons in social media, first I would say I respect the rights to do that because it's your freedom to make uh, whatever statements that you want to make, it's your freedom of speech. But just to share, if you do want to make comparisons, if you do want to learn from other countries, system and whatever, you have to make sure that there is a justification for that comparison. Yeah, Compar Comparative analysis in academic has its own preconditions and requirements. The reason being is that you can't simply compare things which cannot be compared. You want to compare for, uh, with other countries, there must be some uh, similarities and justification for that. So just to summarize on what I've said, Maslow before Blooms, human rights comes together, all the rights comes together, not just rights to education. Okay, and number three, comparison must be done appropriately. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Cheryl. Um, I guess I agree with Sweden. Um, I mean, I'm a big fan of the Nordic education system, but I get it. Uh, they had a very successful sovereign wealth fund, um, a very socialist point of societal view. So I, I, I guess it's an unfair comparison, granted, um, the different ways in which our nation was built on. But I guess it's a right to free speech. Um, I think um, beyond just the philosophy behind the approach of eradicating or at least increasing accessibility, what do you think are the, this is to um, Cheryl, what do you think are the policy steps? Because um, one of the policy steps that you sort of mentioned previously just now was that we ought to look at improving the quality of teachers, give them training and budget. But beyond that, what are we doing wrong with, you know, trying to create accessibility um, for education right now? Yeah, um, so, um in 2018 and 2019, uh, and, and Cikgu Yasmin can attest to this, is that we, we had a chance to sit in the Jautan Kwasil Kajian Dasar Pendidikan Negara, where we worked on some uh, policy reforms. And one of the things that we uh, proposed in the committee at that time was to actually relook at the entire education system, where uh, we are focused more on mastery. So I think um, what we are currently doing now is that we focus more on 
uh, we have a lot of subjects, so it's like many different subjects that the students are doing, but sometimes the depth is not there. Uh, so for example, like a student attended one, maybe they're doing like 10 subjects, right? But then what you find is that sometimes when they go to standard two or standard three, and then you realize that actually their English literacy or their BM literacy is not so strong, or their maths is not so strong. And then uh, they struggle, they struggle throughout the years. So perhaps one of the ways for us to improve accessibility and to ensure that you know, every child can achieve their potential is to a more modular uh, uh, type of education system where we are focused on the mastery of the student. So the child gains like full mastery in that subject before they move on to the, to the next part. And also to make our curriculum more lean, uh, these were some of the suggestions that we put together uh, in the two years um, to make our curriculum leaner, where we are really bringing out just the essentials and also to include TVET as part of the mainstream, uh, where students were actually starting TVET even at Form 1, uh, because it's, it's skills, right, that you want them to learn. Um, at that time, one of the suggestions with I, which I think Wabi Mazli also has spoken about uh, before is to remove science stream and art stream and then students can just pick subjects that they uh, like to do and then they, let's say they want to do engineering so they know what are the core subjects that they can put together. So I, I at that time, I really believe that that would really change the education system because the system that we have now, we know that it's a bit outdated. But I also want to acknowledge at this time that um, the government has been putting into place like Pentak Seran Berasaskan Sekolah, PBS, uh, something that they started for Sekolah Renda and also in Sekolah Menengah, where they are actually looking at the final exam to decide whether you're you are proficient in the subject and also you study one whole year and then you just do the penilaian at the end, right? I don't think that system works anymore. So I really like the Pentaksiran Berasaskan Sekolah on how they are breaking it down to a more uh, modular. So you finish this and then you do your assessment, you finish this part and you do. And assessments are also currently being varied. So I think it's a work in progress towards making our education system more inclusive and more accessible for all students. Thank you, Carol. Um, just a bit on that. I just want to ask you an opinion, right? What do you think about streaming in education? So like science stream goes to science stream, art stream goes to art stream. So say, for example, right, um, I had this qualm um, when I first entered university. I kind of like one, a few subjects that were not offered in the kulia or the faculty that I am, like, for example, the history of the United States. But that wasn't offered to me because that's not my stream. So what do you think about like mix and matching um, streams? I think that was the initial suggestion uh, of the Jautan Kwasa is so that students will get to pick the subjects that they like. So even if your art stream uh, and you wanted to do a subject that was in traditional science stream, right, uh, like perhaps a, a pedagangan or something like that, you have the option to pick that subject, which I know students have now as well. Uh, but to make it more accessible and also until university, I think I think sometimes we are very, it's like cookie cutter, right? So we are very fixed on like, okay, if you want to study engineering, you are confined to these subjects. And uh, because of that, sometimes we realize like our students also become a uh, very uh, one track, uh, very hook, very, very like, you know, uh, very hard for them to look at things uh, thematically or look at things in different subject areas. So I think like, that is the way forward. I presume other countries uh, already do that, where you are actually free to pick different subjects. And maybe Chegu Yasmin can share a bit more on because she's a she's a, a chemistry teacher, right? So on on like breaking up the science and art stream, and, and then how do you how how do you progress after that? Okay, thank you, Cheryl. Maybe Chegu Yasmin, if you could enlighten us as a STEM teacher, how do you break free and open your wings? Okay, uh, thank you, Cheryl. Yeah, I worked with Cheryl before. Okay, uh, basically in JKDPN. And uh, that was our idea. Yeah, we were we were so into it because um, I felt that it's like, it's like how education should be. You shouldn't be confined to just one stream studying what, you know, you like or you don't like. Because I, I put myself in, in place where when I was studying, you know, I had to study everything. I had to take like 11 subjects. It was compulsory. But then when I went to matriculation is when I actually excelled. Why? Because I only have like, you know, a small handful of the subjects that I really want to study and I enjoy doing so. So it's like I hate physics before when I was in, you know, from five, but I could actually do physics after matriculation because I do not have the other subjects that I felt that, you know, it's, it's like it's taxing on me. So it's not something that I really like to do. So 
on on that note, I felt that you know, if if a student wants to study chemistry and business at the same time, you know, it it has to be allowed. But then you know, we, I don't know, I don't know because like at, at the moment, although we say that you know we have STEM stream and we have like you know um a certain choices of stream, but it's still not overlapping. So it's still uh, confined to what the school can offer. So I felt that, you know, this is like a, uh, not really like a work in progress, but probably something that, you know, in the long run, or maybe, you know, parents have choices nowadays because they, that I think that's one of the reasons why parents are taking, um, you know, their child in other institution or maybe like homeschooling, yeah, into, uh, into that. Because I have students now who felt that, you know, chemistry is because, okay, I teach chemistry. So basically they love it, but, they felt that, you know, they don't need the other subjects to supplement it. You know, they want other subjects like arts. Because chemistry and arts, you know, can be something else. Yeah, so I felt that, you know, it has to be, uh, it has, it, it has not to say implemented, but it has, some people actually have to study it. You know, give it a chance, you know, and give it a chance, not like one year or two years, you know. Give it a chance, yeah. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Chico Yasmin. Um, yeah, as like a STEM major myself, I really couldn't care less about uh, the humanities. But then again, you know, on the same page, I feel that uh, maybe the government wants, you know, all every Malaysian student to have a certain basic knowledge in each or every subject that they consider to be important. So I guess what we, what uh, the system should consider instead is to actually rethink how much actually we should um, have all the students study and to rethink how best we could personalize their education to each student to fit their needs the best, which I think is so interesting. I'm actually generally very excited um, to see if like this can be realized in our education system because you know like some other countries, um, European countries have been doing this and maybe it could be an interesting next step for Malaysia. Yeah, but you know, on the as Dr. Mazli pointed out in his speech earlier, how education isn't just about academics, it's also about holistic learning, about the soft skills and like things that you can't academically teach, you know, such as like social skills and things like that. But a recent study published uh, in the Journal of Scientific Reports shows that the impact that the pandemic and lockdown has on people's ability to empathize has been worsened terribly. So in light of this, does this have any impact on the effectiveness of the education system? And if so, how can we address this? So um, could maybe uh, Cheryl share a bit about on this topic? Uh, so I think definitely uh, we know that, I mean, it's no secret that the effects of the pandemic on, on our students, and I see this, uh, definitely my own daughter, the one that kept disturbing me just now, uh, on how because uh, she has to do a lot of her classes online and uh, how she's trying to cope and at sometimes it gets too much for her. Uh, and, and she's only four, right? And the whole Tadika is online. So you can imagine how, uh, how stressful it must be for a four-year-old to learn to do everything online. Uh, but uh, And I think besides that, the pandemic also shed the... Uh, a light on how much uh, on the inequities in our education system. Uh, if previously uh, it was like uh, we know at least the students had a fair chance to come to school to learn, uh, but right now we know that the students who don't have access or they don't have data or don't have devices, they will fall through the gaps. Uh, uh, we know, and Chegu Yasmin also can share on this, we know that a lot of students who are in secondary school will choose to work because they, their families are struggling right now, so they will choose to drop out of school and go to work. And I think recovery, at the recovery stage of the pandemic will be how can we get the students back in school, especially the students who have dropped out, the students who are already well into working because they need to work, right? So you cannot argue with the student who is hungry that education is most important because for them at this point, it is finding money for their families, especially the students who are 15, 16 years old and 17 years old onwards. Um, so I think this is one of the effects or the post pandemic I don't know whether we are post-pandemic, but like, you know, the effects that we were hardly post-pandemic, like, right? still in the thick of it. So uh, the effects that the education system will see, we will see students who are uh, severely left behind. We will see huge learning losses. We will also see um, a, a huge dropout. 
So um, what I'm hoping for perhaps is like post pandemic and the recovery stage is for us to try to find ways to recover these learning losses from students, uh, get students back on track, get students back in school, very strong interventions in school so that students who were left behind during the online classes who had no chance, they will get a chance. So you're not holding them back. You're not saying, uh, okay, if you are like standard one, I'm going to keep you in standard one for another year. No, they are promoted, but at the same time, intervention is provided to them so that, that they can continue learning. Uh, I think all of this needs to be in place as a recovery plan for education. Um, sorry, sorry about that. I actually was thinking about your daughter, like, it must be sad, you know, how does she make friends? She can't experience, like, all of the, the, the nice things about growing up, you know, with the small lunch boxes um, and having the really big water bottles, those things. I, I don't know. So, but interestingly, uh, what she told me is that oh, when school reopens, I don't think I need to go back because everything I can learn is on the iPad. <laughs> So we don't know. We don't know. Maybe, maybe this is for us, right? We feel like Ayokasia and they will never get to enjoy. But maybe this is the normal for them. Like what she said, right? Everything is on Zoom. I don't have to go back to school. So we, we don't know how uh, their world is changing, right? So. Agreed. So um, I guess um, this is actually a pretty great transition to the next question, which is, would education remain online, physical, or a hybrid system and what do you think of their merits? Um, and I guess like on the same line, and I think this is sort of like a consensus based on what was implied throughout, was that whether the pandemic was a necessary evil to push the education system in Malaysia towards digitalizing. Um, maybe um, Dr. Sharo, if you could, um, whether do you think you will remain online or would you prefer it to come back physically? Okay, um, I think, uh... My 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 sister view, yeah. <laughs> okay, I I think that uh personally lah, I think that we will be going partially back into the uh old norms, yeah. So I think the word hybrid that you use might be suitable. Okay, I think I remember last year when uh, because before even before COVID nineteen, I've been um someone who practices uh, uh online learning. Okay, and I've always thought that online learning is good, online learning makes things easy, so it helps me a lot in my class. So the first year when uh, COVID-19 happens, uh, so I, I had no problem, I was very excited because I'm actually doing something that I've already been doing for so long. But um, coming to the second semester after that, I started to realize there's something missing. Yeah, I think that's, that is what we call immediacy between the students and the, the, the teacher actually. Yeah? I miss having those face-to-face -face sessions with my students, you know, because being, being a teacher, being a lecturer, it's not just about giving lectures in lecture halls and conducting tutorials in classes. I do have uh, times when students would come to my room and talk about their personal problems, yeah, talk about uh, their uh, breakups with their boyfriends and girlfriends, you know, their sexuality problems, their problems with their parents, so on and so forth. I think this is... Uh, part and parcel of the whole experience as a student. So it develops them into becoming a human being. This goes back to what uh, Wadi Mazdi was talking about, the, your deputy director was saying about, uh, just was talking about just now, yeah, about the developing the holistic individual and all that. So it, it, it is actually part and parcel of that. So if you ask me whether we'll, we'll stay, uh, I mean, the online learning will be implemented as, as what we have now. For me personally, I don't think so. Most of the lecturers uh, I, that I know of, they are uh, they can't wait for things to go back to to normal. Actually, uh, especially those who are teaching final years, like myself, you know, we teach trial advocacy and drafting of court papers and whatnot. We we really want to meet our students just to share with you one very funny moment. Yeah, after first semester of just meeting everybody online like this, the second semester I've got this permission from the ministry allowing my subject and certain other subjects which has very much practical element to have face to face for a few weeks yeah and when we meet we found it to be very surprising we are of different heights and sizes and it was very awkward for us to meet with each other oh my god you are this big or you are this tall 
you know, but it was, it, I mean, we have this feeling like, oh my God, it's so nice to meet my students. I think, I think we might be having a hybrid after this. Lah. But again, people start to realize that online learning is beneficial, but at the same time, they also start to realize that actually the old norms phone is also very good. Okay, okay thank you. All right. Um, just a bit on that, right? Because um, this is slightly going off topic, but as education becomes online, we're not physical. We try to adapt. So like any documentation, filling out forms, even that is online. So it's begging the question, what is even a university? Um, does a un is a university defined by a physical space where there are buildings with the label, this university? Or is a university like an institution that is defined by a philosophy? So even if you're not physically together, the philosophy defines what is a university. So if anyone wants to um, chip in, maybe Dr. Sharo, you can, because um, you're teaching at a university. Oh, um, once again, once again, I'm playing the safe uh, approach here. Yeah, my personal view is, is very extreme, I would say, because when whenever I say this in any workshops, I think everybody looks so surprised. Yeah? I don't believe in university being a university as in like the building and the compound and everything. I believe in the concept of uh, professors uh, being like a grab driver. And I believe in buffets, a jukebox uh, concept of education. I mean, the students should be allowed to choose whatever they want. Okay, and um, I think that we should, uh, um, uh, I mean, like uh, university uh, now, the way how we're doing it now is like we have degrees and specializations and whatever not. Um, I, I, my, my personal view is that in the future, okay, uh, we might come to a point whereby we can be more flexible, yeah? So instead of having uh, degrees like that, maybe we can have nano degrees or micro credentials where students can actually choose the skills that they want to learn. Yeah, and professors are actually chosen, like what I said, like grab drivers, you know. Uh, if the student wants to learn from them, they can go to that lecturer and learn from them uh, and learn from, from him or her. Yeah? So I think um, that's how I look at it, yeah. All right, thank you. I don't think that view is extreme. I feel like it's more <laughs> innovative than it is that. Um, we always welcome innovation because it's always the thing that sparks progress that leads to a better um, world. So this is sort of going to the last topic. So IUM 20, IUM's 2021-2022 roadmap talks about the need to humanize education, which is essentially the attempt of moving away from education for the sake of employment, but rather education as a tool for social development, creating holistic identities of people, our self-identity. You could be an engineer, but also um, the next Michelangelo, or like a lawyer who is also um, going to be the rising artist singing songs, which one of my close friends is actually fits that description. So as important figures in the machinery that is the national education system, what should be the steps forward or the steps to be done in order to move towards humanizing education? Um, Cheikh Yasmin, maybe you can take the floor first. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Hilmi. Um, I guess um, it boils down on what you want to learn at the end of the day, yeah? Because um, humanizing your education is like telling you, you know, at the end of the day, aren't we all graduates of Google and Instagram? Yeah, okay. So there's no need to actually, um, there's no need actually to confine uh, students to, to schools only to, for them to get knowledge, yeah? So, like uh, there's one of my students, uh, Manush said that, you know, it has been a year, yeah, since this uh, pandemic struck us. And what's more um, human than actually we adapting to the situation. So we know that the mindset of student has actually changed, but did we do anything to actually tap into that? Yeah. And um, is it something that we actually um, have it like in only, only in us and not with the students? Yeah. So basically, we need to, to look at how we adapt from physical classes to the online classes. So when, when we do that, we see that, you know, the students are actually embracing the learning online well. Yeah, but 
we as uh, educator we always thought that you know like, what can we do as teachers yeah we sort of like you know make sure that online or physical we make sure that you know the level of education the standard of education that we are imparting is the same and in that we ensure that you know the students are actually having the same access to the education level regardless of the means of it so like basically I felt that, you know, um, yeah, I do miss a lot on practicals and outings because that's what I did with my students. But that doesn't mean that, you know, my students are not there with me. They're always with me. They're, they're just, uh, how do I say, not physically with me. So, like, I always encourage them to do even activities at home. Yeah? My Form 3 students, my Form 5 students, like, you know, they create plastic toys out of milk and, you know, they post it online. Yes, I actually, like, you know, force them to do so. Yeah they're listening and they're watching me now also actually but they them see that you know they can actually be in touch with their surroundings and do some self-exploration so that you know they're not just confined to the fact that okay I'm just going to attend class just to pass exam yeah not that so it's more of like you know trying out and um, be with the teacher be one with the teacher be one with the education system so it, it's not something that's easy but it's something that we all have to be adaptive of yeah. Okay, thank you, Chikri Aspen, um, for the perspective as a teacher. Um, so to Shara, as a pers from the perspective um, of a person who's actually um, part of the committee of drafting education. It was. No, what, no, Chris, no. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I think um, when if we look at the OECD uh, learning compass for 2030, uh, we see one of the key elements that they put into is the well-being of our students. I think for years now, well-being is something that has been uh, ignored or maybe not even uh, looked at lightly. But we know that um, now, uh, especially now in the pandemic, right, more and more of our students are, are very open about uh, how they are struggling with uh, mental health issues and, and how they are just struggling to cope right with whatever that's going on online so if you look at the living compass for 2030 the key component that they've put in is well-being how can we as educators uh, as trainers and how can the education system look and put in well-being as a major component not an afterthought not as something that comes oh by the way if you have any problem you can speak to the counselor but as the key element in the education system. I think that is the step forward. So we are actively seek, uh, asking our students to um, check in with themselves. We're asking them to reflect. We're asking them to rest. Uh, we're taking steps to ensure mindfulness is part of our syllabus as well. I think that is key. And also the other thing, if you look at uh, students, uh, we're looking at the skills that the students need for the future, right? We know that whatever we are teaching them today, we are preparing them for jobs that don't even exist yet, right? So how do we prepare students for jobs that don't even exist is to provide them with the skills that will help them to be highly adaptable, that will help them to um, take on any challenge at that time. And one of the things really core to talking about humanizing education is um, in the learning conversation, is responsibility, uh, uh, transformative competencies are uh, among the things that we do how the education system maybe it will be a hybrid one. Maybe students will do one day online and then four days in school, right? How can we make sure that we are really pushing them towards developing skills uh, to help them sustain jobs that don't even exist yet? I think that will be the core of uh, our education system moving forward. Okay, um, thank you, Sharon. I actually really like that the whole idea of wealth and well-being being the forefront because um, this is sort of a self-reflection. The point of education is to improve social mobility. And what is the point of improving social mobility if your well-being is not taken care of? So I, I really agree with that because it should be part and parcel, if not a priority. University educator, what do you think should be the steps to humanize education? Okay, I think uh, most of the things uh, mentioned by both the speakers, uh, I agree with them. Yeah, so I'm just going to uh, add uh, two more things. Uh, number one, uh, perhaps if you want to 
uh, proceed towards that direction, perhaps we can uh, try to explore further on experiential learning. Because our learning before this learning, um, I mean like uh, student learns from experience. So they go through the experience, they have reflections. And based on the reflections, they will conceptualize what they have learned and they will implement it in the next experience. So I think perhaps that is one way to go. Yeah, Explore experiential learning and try to implement it. And in line with this, I would also say that um, you would have to, uh, uh, this is a continuation from I think Jack's question to me just now. You have to look back into how you assess the student because we are, uh, even before the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we have been hearing lots of feedbacks from the uh, industry saying that we're producing lots of uh, excellent on paper graduates, but are not industry ready. There's a reason for that, yeah, because they are, they are actually being assessed only in one aspect, which is the cognitive achievement, cognitive development. So um, after this, yeah, if we were to uh, change, I think we would have to see how we assess. There's so many, um, not just their knowledge, yeah, not just on their knowledge, but also on their uh, uh, other skills as well. So that's and then we can resolve it. Okay, I, I'll keep it short. Thank you. No, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sharo, for that answer. I, I think we are drawing closer to the end of the session, but I think as like the final concluding question from uh, us, the moderators, it would be um, to, for each of you to be, uh, just very briefly, um, what would you like an audience member who's like currently tuning in to take away just one, if they can only take away just one thing from this session, what would you like it to be? And we can maybe go first check with Yasmin and then Cheryl. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Jack. Okay. Um, I would like to, today actually I, I was, uh, how to say, I was actually sharing what my students said because I believe that, you know, their voices are mine and and their voices are actually what we actually should hear. Yeah. So um, this student of mine said this to me today. His name is Putranik. So he said that each of us live dependent and bound to our individual knowledge and our awareness. And all that is what we call reality. So, but both knowledge and awareness are equivocal. So one's reality might be another illusion. We are all living inside our own fantasy. So basically what he meant was, you know, in this pandemic, yeah, you have to rely on your Self, okay, to be self set your uh, take the negativity around you to turn it into something positive and um, eradicate every problems in the world and you know be yourself, be the person that you want to be because our students are actually the ones that we should focus on and their voices have not been heard actually. Nobody actually asks you know the students, so that's my take point over you. Why don't we actually talk to the students and let them tell us? tell everyone, tell the whole country yeah, what they thought of what is right and best for them. Just, uh, they are growing and they're actually learning a lot from being confined in four walls of uh, you know, their houses. Yeah, that's my last point. Thank you, Jago Yasmin. Uh, appreci appreciating well, all the shout outs from your students throughout the session. I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure they'll be very happy with that. And yeah, they are, <laughs> yeah. they are. I'm, I'm yeah. glad they are. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe we can next go to Cheryl. Uh, I think uh, definitely building on what Cheguya says, the pandemic has given us a chance to uh, see that actually a lot of our uh, systems that we have put into place in our education system is not pandemic proof. Right? Whatever that we traditionally believe to be true about an education system uh, has been challenged because of this pandemic all the exams that we put into place, all the co-curriculum activities, everything, everything can be gone uh, because we, and we know that the, at the essence of it is we want our students to learn. We want them to achieve their full potential. We want them to be good human beings, right? And so I think because uh, this pandemic has given us a chance to actually think about the systems and the education system. So coming out of this would be to actually um, 
let go, like Cikgu Yasmin said just now, actually our students are ready and they are very, um, very highly adaptable creatures, right? Like, like I said, my daughter just now, she's only four, but immediately it's like, oh, it's fine. I can study online. Like, you know, who, who says I need to go to school? So building on that, it's very important to listen to their voices, to take into account how can we build a more students education system an education system that will benefit them and this time taking their voices into consideration and so um i think from that we know that moving forward we cannot do the things that we have done before a lot of things did not work will not work so we have to like you know make peace and move on with that but now uh redefine the education system redefine on what we believe to be learning and i think when we do that and when we take into consideration our students' voices, then we'll definitely have a very successful education system. Thank you, Cheryl. I, I, uh, I think it is very, very funny that we've, we've gone this far in like the education system and we've, we've forgotten that, you know, we've forgotten to ask the main people who are, you know, in the system itself. It might seem like as clear as day, but, you know, sometimes... The, the most obvious thing is like the hardest thing to remember. Yeah, so that was really nice, Cheryl. Thank you so much. And maybe we could have a uh, Dr. Cheryl to conclude uh, this this part of the session. Okay, I think uh, I would uh, conclude by saying that we have to take this whole COVID thing as one transformational learning session for all of us, students and teachers, yeah? Because when we talk about adults, yeah, we cannot be taught via normal pedagogies where you know, we sit in class and people teach us. This is how you're supposed to do things, yeah? We learn from mistakes and only from our mistakes, we will try to change and, you know, we learn. Uh, so I think this is all a transformational learning experience. This is actually a theory, actually, by Mazero. I keep on giving theories. I hope it will enrich everyone tonight. <laughs> okay, so according to Mazero, uh, most, uh, most adults usually, not, not most adults, adults usually, they will not learn until and unless they have... Um, uh, made something wrong, okay, and they will learn from the mistake. So I think um, this whole COVID-19 experience is actually making us think and uh, make, making us think back about things that perhaps we have taken for granted for so long, yeah. So now it's the time for us to remember and try to reflect and try to improve based on uh, whatever things that we have observed. I think that's, that's basically it, lah. All right, thank you, um, Dr. Shah. I just want to add, like, for adults to understand that it was a mistake, admittance that it was a mistake is the first step. <laughs> um, I think we have one question. Um, Fatih Alisha um, on Facebook asked. Um, so she asked, um, I would like to ask Dr. Sharo regarding university required courses. Um, what is his view on consideration to reevaluate these courses? Um, in assessing a student's um, CGPA at the time of a pandemic? You know, the, the, the ones that are added on that are not necessarily streamlined to the current degrees that you are. What do you think about that and where, how do we sort of reconcile this? Okay, we have, to look at, we, we have to look at this from two angles, yeah? Firstly, we have to understand from the university's perspective, yeah? University usually would give you this required courses, uh, compulsory courses for you to take because it is actually in line with the, um, with the spirit of the university itself, okay? For example, I was in UIA. I remember the, the required courses were actually something that, um, I had to take science of Hadith and science of Quran. I scored A anyway, eh? Okay, so... <laughs> So, I mean, like, it, the, the reason why the required courses are actually imposed on you is because the university has this sort of ideals that they want to achieve for their students, yeah? And, for example, in UKM, we have things like, you know, um, uh, all these Chitra courses, yeah, where it, it actually um, embeds into the student things and values which the university feels that their graduates should have once they have graduated. So that's from the university perspective. But I also understand from the student's perspective, it, it sort of like it becomes a headache for you, isn't it? It's like, I'm having to, I have to do this. You know, it, it doesn't actually relate to my course. Yeah. So I just want to pass this. You become a surface learner. Yeah. So I just want to pass this. And that's it. That's the end of it. So my suggestion would be um, 
if we have the opportunity yeah, to move forward after this, I think what we can do is we have to, if, if the required courses, yeah, if the compulsory courses are really something that is necessary for the student, then the, 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 the TL has to be made very meaningful. Instead of just, you know, uh, something that, I think the, the mindset among the students is just like, oh, I just have to take this. This, three, this process has to be completed before I reach my final year, for example. So I'm just going to take it. How many Arabic you have to take us? Huh? Now, at the moment, I used to have to take six levels huh? or two levels. That is not fair. So please ask them to take six levels. Okay. <laughs> okay so I think that from the university's perspective, it's actually part of the university's aspiration. But from the uni student's perspective, I think what the university can do to help the student is basically to make it more meaningful, not just something that they have to take. The, 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 the customization of the subject it has to be something that, uh, you know, is different compared to the courses that is given to the students from that discipline itself. Yeah. So I think that's it. Lah. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sharul, for, for the answer. We have another question from uh, Amira Idrus, which is directed to Cikgu Yasmin. Um, for students living in households that make it difficult for them to have proper access and a suitable environment for online classes, how can the school and teachers assist, assist these students? Would you say that asynchronous, uh, a bracket non-live classes would be the best choice or are there any other alternatives? Okay, thank you. Mm, okay, um, the questions are you know, basing on what teachers can do, but we must not forget that the first teachers a child have in their life is actually their parents. Okay, so in the first place, you know, what what can the parents do to support their child to gain education in the first place? So if they cannot do that, then they seek help and the teachers can only supplement as much, okay, but not, you know, the full entire education of a child cannot be like, you know, a burden on teachers alone. So it has to be a, you know, workable situation between the parents and the teachers. So basically, if you say that, you know, it's a, it's an, it's in a, an unsuitable situation. So what can we actually do about it? Do you want to send, you know, a whole, like, build up more schools there in the place of, you know, bring the connectivity there? So, you know, it, it has to be like you know a workable situation between the parents and students. So I, I can only share what my school did because even though my school is actually in Petaling Jaya, yeah, but we have about uh, eighty percent of our students in B forty, and I think that with the pandemic, you know, the number of students that falls to B forty will be more, and uh, we also have parents yeah who actually are illiterate yeah, so they don't know when the teachers are sending messages to their phone to the children they don't know what is it and you know stuff like that but the the team uh, of the counselors and also the admins and the teachers in school in my school we basically go to the house and to find out what are the real problems and from there we treat it like you know on case to case basis we don't have like you know one tailor made size uh, you know uh, solution for all of them yeah but uh, i felt that you know it has to be a win-win situation between parents and teachers and not like, you know, being said that, okay, you want education teachers, you should do this, yeah? Because now we see that, you know, most parents are actually complaining because, you know, they felt that, you know, their child is confined at home and teachers are not doing the job. But don't forget that the first teacher that a child has is actually the parents, okay? So I believe that, you know, the, the, working, the working method is uh, teachers can actually go and find out. Yeah, find out about the, the situation and see what we can do on case-to-case -case basis. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chikri Yasmin. Um, so we'll have time for one more question. Um, and this is a very thought-provoking question um, from one of the um, viewers. So Cheryl said that the, so I'm quoting this question verbatim. Cheryl said that the question of education is to produce good people. I said, I, meaning me, says that it's about wellness and happiness. Is it really the role of teachers or the society to provide this? They are, so the speaker, uh, the viewer is uncomfortable with education with a moral slash spiritual slant. 
And therefore, it begs the question, on whose shoulders should the burden of teaching spirituality rest on? Maybe Cheryl, you can ask. Uh, you could take the floor. Yeah. Uh, so I am definitely of the belief that uh, it takes a village to raise a child, right? So it is not just solely the responsibility, uh, responsibility of the school or the responsibility of like uh, just uh, uh, the teacher and, and things like that. It is the entire community that you take to actually make sure that a child is successful. And I think uh, as long as we continue to believe that each of us have a, a part to play in ensuring that our children have uh, greater access to education, in ensuring that our children achieve their full potential, uh, we will not see it as like singular, like, okay, this is the role of the school, this is the role of the parent. I think... Um, uh, one of the things that we have seen in the pandemic is uh, the greater a greater parent involvement. And I know that a lot of parents have said that previously they didn't know that their child could not read or they didn't know that their child was not good at a certain subject, but now they know because they are at home with their child and they're working with their child. So we see actually... Um, it's showing how great the responsibility of the parent is in the education and research also points to like actually the first uh, most important uh, factor in a child is their parents and their family uh, and how they will help them. So I think um, while uh, I, I said that the uh, education systems produce good people, I also said that the education system is to help a child achieve their full potential and I also strongly believe that it's not just one person, it's not the teacher, it's not the school, but it's everyone playing their part to make sure that uh, a child achieves their full potential. Yeah. Okay, Cheryl, um, thank you so much. Um, I, get, I, I agree that it takes a village to raise a child, but it's also, I guess, if I may add, um, a very um, hard question when it comes to it being a chicken or egg. Does society influence the education system or does the education system influence the society? Will society ever embrace spirituality if education never embraces it um, in the first place? So I, I guess it, this is going to be a never-ending question, but I appreciate the answer given. Okay, I think we're done with um, the panel discussion. Uh, I personally thought it was an amazing discussion, um, thought-provoking, challenging status quo, um, challenging the personal belief. Um, so all the panelists have given the one thing that they want to take away. I think the moderators should have one thing. I Maybe you can give it to Jax to say what he thinks he wants the viewers to remember from this. I feel attacked. No, no, I'm kidding. No. <laughs> I, I was just like sighing a breath of relief because it's over. Uh, well, Dr. Cheryl, what Dr. Cheryl was saying, uh, adults learn from mistakes. So I think I definitely learned a lot from today. <laughs> so, um, no, okay, I was kidding. Uh, I'm not, okay, yeah. So I think one thing I, I would like to take away from this is maybe like rethinking just the very definition of education. I think it's like really changed how I perceive education, like the very definition of it, who is it serving, and is education, you know, just purely academics or edu is education, you know, just the provision of basic rights? Because like without the basis, there is no education. That's that's what I took away from it, where it's like in a sense of how it, it is hard to achieve education now in Malaysia, in certain places, in certain communities. And we have to do more than that. So it, it includes, you know, redefining what education actually means and putting well-being and welfare at the center, which I, which was new for me because I always thought of these concepts as like very distinct things. But yeah, I've consolidated these two concepts. Yeah, what about you, Helmi? Um, I just hope the people who have the power to make policy are not scared of challenging status quo and innovate um, with the needs of the current era. Right, um, I guess we are done. And so thank you so much to Chegu Yasmin, Dr. Sharol and Cheryl um, for a wonderful discussion, a very thought provoking one, a one that isn't filled with like, I don't know, um, it, it, it's not scared of challenging what we know of um, status quo. Um, so with that, from the bottom of my heart, very thank uh, a lot of thank yous to everyone um, for just educating us, which is funny because you are educators yourself. Uh, so thank you, everyone. <laughs>